Hello guys and gals, welcome back to another episode of Haunted Gaming. This time we do a Pokemon Cree pasta, since we haven't done one in a while, called My First Pikachu. What follows is an account based on my experiences years ago. I tried to remember events as best as I could. Not all the details may be right, but they're as close to what happened to my first days of gaming as they can possibly be. Some may call what I have to describe as creepy, some may not. Personally, I don't believe that anything I experienced was evil or even supernatural at all, but then again, I also never got the answers to any of my questions about what happened either. What you think about this, whether you believe any of it or not, is entirely up to you. So remember when the first Pokemon, you know, when, when the craze had started? How everyone and their brother had red and blue, Pokemon red and blue? Everyone but me, though. My parents were very anti-video games. And I didn't get my first console until I went away to Job Corps. Of course, I made up for it. I bought a Dreamcast off of somewhere, an N64 from a local game shop. A friend got me a Game Boy Advance SP and the, uh, you know, at the time, the new Final Fantasy Tactics. I got a Pokemon knockoff too, something called like Demi Kids. I got the dark version, pretty much solely because it was dark. It's actually pretty good, but I didn't find out how rare it was until after I sold it for a new game. My loss, I guess. I kept going back to the shop for new games, and I loved everything I got. Well, mostly everything. It was nice because it was a small shop, so they'd buy and sell, you know, pretty much anything as long as it worked. And you could find neat, obscure titles sometimes. I used to be pretty adventurous with my purchases, grabbing whatever looked cool at the time, and they were a goldmine for that. For some reason though, I never got any Pokemon games, even though I played a friend's copy when the first generation was new, and I absolutely loved it. I guess it was just the price, I had to budget pretty carefully, because I had three systems and only got so much money in my, uh, you know, JC paychecks. Whatever the reason, one day I saw a deal I just couldn't pass up. The first gen remakes had just come out a few months before, and although I didn't know much about them, with what living up at the, uh, you know, center and being obsessed with gaming to make up for all the years I hadn't had any, I had heard a bit. I knew it was a recreation of the first set of games, that, uh, they were given enhancements for the new systems, you know, add a descriptor and the name to differentiate them. And while that was pretty much it, I also knew that being recent titles, they were a little more than I could afford at the time, so... You know, even so, I've been wanting one. I didn't know much about the new Pokémon, but first gen is what had originally caught my interest. So, when I found one for cheap at the game store, only around $8 with tax, I had to have it. Now, I say that it was one of the new set, but that's not quite true. I thought it was at the time. Maybe it was even supposed to be. It wasn't, though. Not really. The cartridge was this translucent amber yellow color, and there was a yellow swirl on the labels with the words Pika Yellow Version under the title. To me, it looked like any other Pokemon game I'd ever seen, and as far as I knew, each set had contained three games. Two main ones, and a third one, you know, with some added things that they'd release later. So I didn't really think much of it. Figuring they'd just remade the special Pikachu Edition Yellow Version along with the other two, I do remember asking why it was so cheap, however, and apparently some trouble reading the cartridge on start, and that the seller had warned about, but only happened, you know, one in five times when the guy at the store checked it. Since I didn't mind that, I forked over the money and bought it, along with, you know, a couple other games. It started up pretty typically, you know, title, Pikachu, light blue background with crackling lightning, from what I know now, all matching the real games. I couldn't say how well it followed the original Yellow, since I never played it then or now, but the story followed the anime pretty well. You know, Gary takes Eevee, you find a wild Pikachu that hates you, then you befriend it and start your journey. And for the next few weeks, I played it all the time during my breaks. All my other consoles when, uh, you know, trade classes let out. Only a little bit at a time, so I wasn't, you know, making fantastic progress but enough to screw around and learn about the features. It was pretty cool, actually. The big mechanic I remember was that when you talked to your Pikachu, you know, which followed behind you, you'd get a set of options like play, scold, and praise. Sort of like a Tamagotchi, I guess. There would also sometimes be little events with special options. It was interesting, because Pikachu's nature, the nature, you know, and his stats, could actually change depending on what you did with him. For instance, when I first tried to evolve him into Raichu and it didn't work, I thought he was refusing and scolded him a few times. I forget who it was that finally told me that Yellow, the version Pikachu, had never evolved. Couldn't. Temporarily giving him a quiet nature until I could get him to forgive me. Sounds weird, doesn't it? Saying I had to get a bunch of pixels to forgive me? Well, that's just how it worked, though. The little digital Pikachu responded to its treatments like a real living thing. I even remember these little pseudo cutscenes where it would zap Ash like in the show when it was mad. I thought that was hilarious at first, uh, you know, it wasn't so funny though when I was trying to get Tesla to have the personality I wanted to keep getting electrified. 
or when he'd disobey me in battle because he was upset, and when he turned on me midway through the Pokemon Tower, causing me to black out and return to my last Pokemon Center. I'd had enough. I saved, not wanting to lose progress, and went back to my other games until I felt less sore about it. I didn't go back to Pika Yellow until one day when I was feeling sick and couldn't go to my trade. Since I couldn't leave the dorm except for mealtime, and staff pretty much expected you to be in your bed when you know they came in to check, I didn't have anything better to do than play Game Boy all day. Out of boredom, I popped in the Pokemon cartridge, and things took a bad turn, almost immediately. First, despite almost never having a problem with it before, the startup glitch came with a vengeance. I must have tried five or six times, blowing in the car, flicking the switch quickly, but it kept either freezing on the word Nintendo, or going back and staying the way within moments of the title appearing. Finally though, I got it to turn on, and just as I was about to give up, there was no lightning on the title screen, no Pikachu cry, but I thought, hey, at least it's running. When it started though, it was obvious something was wrong. I was back in the Pokemon Center at Lavender Town, just like when I'd saved. But Tesla was gone, his sprite wasn't following me, and he wasn't in my party. In fact, running around the center in a panic, I couldn't find a sign of my Pikachu anywhere. So in desperation, I tried talking to Brock and Misty, who, like in the anime, were traveling with me in the game. Both of them gave me some standard messages, like they, like they would do, you know, when the game was trying to not so subtly remind you to play with your virtual pet. Ash, have you played with Tesla lately? It looks like Tesla wants something, that sort of thing, completely useless. Fearing it must be some kind of event I hadn't run into yet, I decided to look around town, and for whatever reason, I thought of the Lavender Volunteer Pokemon House, you know, where lost Pokemon are supposed to be taken care of. Sure enough, as soon as I walked in, a Pikachu cry played and a familiar sprite ran up to me. Ash automatically turned, and I got the message. Tesla is looking at you expectantly, with options for praise, scold, and gift. Well, I wasn't going to reward Pikachu for running away, and I didn't want to scare it into leaving again, so, you know, I selected praise. Pikachu sprite got a little smile over its head, and the message, Tesla has joined your party, was displayed, so... All was right in the world again. I thought. Double checking my prodigal Pikachu stats, I noticed that its nature had changed again. It was marked as lonely now. I shrugged it off, sure, I hadn't noticed a day or night cycle, but I knew from friends that the second gen games had this internal clock, so I figured maybe this one did too. The game was probably just trying to use negative reinforcement on me for not playing in a while. It's a cheap gimmick to make the player feel more involved. Game designers love doing that stuff as much as they can, though. Figuring I should try to fix it before I went on, I took Pikachu around, talked to people, played with him, bought the little guy a lemonade. After a while, his nature changed to docile, which wasn't great, but then I, but, but at least told me that he knew I cared again. So feeling like I had done my duty as a virtual caretaker, I returned to Lavender Town to try the tower again. Things had went fairly normal, but now and then I would get a weird status message when Tesla was fighting, my Pikachu was flinching, becoming paralyzed, even getting confused at seeming, at seeming random invites. Not often, but enough to make me concerned. I thought about just saving and turning the game off, but it had been so hard to get it to start that I was just reluctant, especially in the case it made me go get Pikachu, you know, from the, uh, from the live LVPH again, you know. At some point in the tower, Tesla changes natures again, becoming quirky. The random status effect stopped at that point. The only thing I remember thinking at the time was that Pikachu must have stopped being afraid of ghosts. Then we got to Marowak's ghost, and things turned out again. Throughout the fight, Marowak kept using Torment, a move I was unfamiliar at the time. The effect was annoying, though not too bad. But for some reason, after the first time it was used, I started getting the message, Tesla is in love with Marowak. Though strangely, none of the, uh, none of the other effects of infatuation. We won the battle, even in the end. It was a little help for my Ivysaur, although I preferred using Pikachu. Soon after that, I began to notice that my little Pikachu seemed different. It noticed that the game would pitch, shift, the cry to make it sound sad or happy when it played before. Now, whenever we wanted a battle, it sounded a little too harsh, a little too sharp. I, I just couldn't shake the feeling that Tesla was eager to fight. Its nature would sometimes shift between quirky and serious for no reason I could find and far more often than it felt like it should. The next time he leveled up though, it just got really weird. Tesla wanted to learn Torment, the move that Marowak had used. I figured it was just a change in the move set, and said no, it didn't really fit my strategy, and Pikachu immediately tried to learn another move, Shadow Rush. Had I known anything about the GameCube Pokemon game out at the time, this might have worried me. Either way, I was still confused with learning two moves in one level, and decided to just cancel the Shadow Rush too. Only the game wouldn't let me. A message popped up reading Tesla disobeyed orders, and then Tesla forgot Slam and learned Shadow Rush. 
Needless to say, this unnerved me a little. I never heard of a Pokemon disobeying outside of battle before, however, the interactions with Pikachu seem to be the focus of the game. So I figured that the programmers were just trying to drive home the point that he had a will of his own. It bugged me a little that I had been saddled with a weaker move, but the accuracy was higher and Slam hadn't been a key weapon in my arsenal, so I counted my blessings that it hadn't replaced, you know, like Thunderbolt, and moved on. Figuring I might as well at least, you know, take a look at the attack animation, I went to try Shadow Rush out on something. I forget what I was up against, you know, one of the countless nuisance Pokemon you find on like every patch of tall grass, I guess. The attack itself was nothing special, but I was surprised when it said it was super effective. I went to double check the type after battle and found that it showed up as three question marks. Normally only the types of eggs and the move curse. Hmm, it was weird, but I also found it kind of cool in a dark, mysterious way. I was okay to work the next day, so it was, you know, back to my routine of trade and small fits of playing. It was probably the short sessions that kept me from noticing that something was wrong. Sometimes Pikachu would just bump into me when I wasn't moving. All his cries started to have this almost impatient quality to them, not just the battle ones. Sometimes I get a message about my Pikachu's affectionate or sometimes her irritable behavior. Even though I hadn't checked him, occasionally I would use Shadow Rush when I was in a bind. I delighted in learning that it was super effective on everything. I was less delighted when my Pikachu started ignoring orders to use it on his own. Finally, I decided to just switch to my other favorite, Wartortle. I'd done right by all my Pokemon level-wise, even if I did figure Pikachu as my primary. Despite seeing less field time, Nemo, you know, named for the Vern novel, not the Fish movie, had a good move set and okay stats. So I wasn't really worried about the change in the lineup. Things went first, you know, fine at first, really. After a few days, though, I noticed that Pikachu's message were almost always about it being upset or ignoring me or wanting to train. Its nature was just stuck on serious, and nothing I did would change it. Not even back to quirky anymore. I've read stories about Pokemon who always, you know, won a battle, but this wasn't like that. When I tried to switch in Pikachu, I sometimes got messages like Tesla ignored orders, or it was saying current Pokemon is already in battle. I felt like my Pikachu was sulking because I had replaced it. That came that fateful battle. You know, then came that battle. The last I ever played on Pika Yellow, it was a tag battle, and I sent out Wartortle and Pikachu to battle James and Jesse's Weezing slash Arbic pair. Pikachu's cry had pitch shifted again, and the sound was mournful enough to make me shiver. I was having trouble in the fight too, mostly because Pikachu wouldn't follow commands. The weird status effects were back too, with the torment and attract effects both popping up at just seemingly random times. Things took a turn for the worse with just two lines that are burned permanently into my mind. Tesla disobeyed orders, Tesla used Thundershock. Then, shocking me to my core, the attack animation played over Nemo. Electricity on a water type. That attack was super effective, and my Wartortle fainted then and there. I put in a Fero to replace Wartortle and immediately swapped Pikachu for Charmander as well. From there I managed to win the fight, but afterwards I checked Tesla's info. Its nature had changed for the first time in a long while, from serious to naughty. Seeing that and remembering what it did to Nemo, I saved quit, determined not to play again until I knew what the heck was going on with my Pikachu. When the weekend rolled around, I signed up for the computer lab, hoping to get some answers. I made a thread about a game on a Pokemon related forum I went on sometimes, hoping to get some you know, help from a more experienced player. What followed caught me completely by surprise. Though I'm sure you can guess, the thread exploded with flame comments calling me a troll, cool story bro, and worse, you know, the rancor of a vengeful internet basically. Not knowing any better, I protested and yelled back. It didn't take long enough for a mod to lock the thread and message me, you know, warning about spamming the board with creepy pastas. Confused, I managed back to protest my innocence. He got upset at me at first, saying I'd taken my joke far enough, but I somehow got him to listen. I don't think he believed me, at least. Not that the game was legit. I have to admit, I wonder sometimes, too. But he eventually gave me the IM of someone he knew at Game Freak, who had answered questions for the site in the past. Believe me, I wasted no time in using that. Of course I couldn't get a hold of the guy, there's some cosmic force that keeps these sort of things from working out, I guess. I decided to check back the next weekend, though. Much to my surprise, a Game Freak employee messaged me almost as soon as I had signed in. All it said was, I got your message, let's talk, and nothing else. I remember thinking that sounded ominous, but not caring as long as it got me a game I could enjoy playing again. He asked a lot of questions, everything from where I'd gotten the game to what kind of progress I'd made. My feelings on the content, it was intense and a little weird. But I felt like I was getting somewhere with this guy, so I went with it. I was pretty much—it was pretty much, you know, the story sequentially, with me guiding, with me, you know, him guiding me in it. We got to the events of the Pokemon Tower when he started replying a lot slower. After I mentioned the attack on War Turtle, he just stopped replying at all. I tried to find out some more info, you know, from him, 
but my computer time ended before I could. Two weeks went by without a word from my only hope for answers, then one day during trade I was called in to speak to the center director. When I got there, there were two police officers waiting with serious looks on their faces. One of them told me that a report had been filed indicating that I was in possession of, a st of, of stolen property. In response to my pleas of innocence, they said they didn't think I knew it was stolen, and that if I turned it over, I wouldn't be charged with anything. What was I supposed to say? I agreed, and they informed me that they were looking for my Pokemon game. They didn't call it that, they used, you know, much more official sounding terms, but that was what they meant. Nervously, I handed it over and they politely told me not to discuss the incident, it was part of an ongoing investigation or something. I tried contacting the guy at Game Freak, but, you know, he blocked me. I eventually just put it out of my mind. Did I really want to know? Of course. I suppose you're wondering why I'm bringing it up now. Well, not too long ago, I was on eBay. I saw a really interesting listing, and it sparked some old memories. It's too bad I didn't have the money to bid. Really, I wish I had. Someone out there, though. They won that auction. They won. And now they have themselves a very interesting new game. On a shiny amber-yellow cartridge. Have fun. Well, now, that was actually a good Pokemon Creepypasta. This is one that I like for a very specific reason. It actually seems legit. Out of all the phenomenon, you know, when you look at the gameplay phenomenon, all the Pokemon hacks I've played personally, this one doesn't really possess anything that seems unbelievable to actually happen. Now, as far as cliches go, something I'm not really mentioning, you know, a whole lot, but, you know, as far as cliches go, because, you know, I'll sound like a broken record, most notably, this had the usage of Lavender Town, which I know people, it's part of Pokemon, but it is very overused. And then you got eBay somewhat at the end. I mean, it's mentioned, but, you know, not in the manner that we really are accustomed to seeing. But, you know, if you wait a minute and you really look at it, you know, it actually works. I noticed them, but, you know what, they were actually inserted well enough, you know, and I really ignored them. In a way, it, you know, it kept the tale flowing. It's not that cliches are bad. If used properly, they actually work with the story. Now moving on, as far as how creepy it was, I would say it's a lot more intriguing as we delve into it, even though, you know, creepy and intriguing overlaps somewhat. Mind you, it, it is really creepy when you look at the somewhat unhealthy realistic relationship with this Pikachu and its actions, you know, just running away off and, you know, not listening to you at all. We can see over time moods changing and this Pikachu just becomes more and more erratic. And then towards the end, just downright evil harming one of its own allies, with no regret it seems. It was definitely a nice story, it was lengthy, had good phenomenon, again, phenomenon that made sense. Some of it is actually combined with actual points of gameplay, however the whole Tamagotchi scolding and praising system I really don't remember from Pokemon Yellow. But then again, I played it a long time ago, and this could possibly just be an added feature of the ROM. But yeah, this is compiled well enough to offer a tale worth reading. You know, all in all, this is a pretty good creepypasta, and I really didn't have an issue with it. It all melded well together, and it didn't overstay its welcome. It wasn't overtly long. It was actually the perfect length, and uh, I enjoyed it. What would you rate this creepypasta, and what would you change to make it better? And do you, personally, believe the author? Let me know in the comments below. This has been another episode of Haunted Gaming, and if you like what you saw, then like, comment, and subscribe. This is me, Mudahar, and I'm out.